warrior. In 1854, this British cavalry officer was recorded by a device that would shape warfare as much as gunpowder. A peaceful device, the camera. This is no romantic picture. The camera would tell a grim story the world had never heard. Men like these were about to face the full force and horror of industrialized war in a tiny corner of the Russian Empire called the Crimea. In 1854, Russia already was an industrial power. Her factories produced giant cannon and howitzers like these at the fortress of Sebastopol. For centuries, the weapons men fought with were the product of ancient technology. At the time of the American and French revolutions, men had been fighting for 300 years with gunpowder, horses, and cold steel. The men who fought at Waterloo in the early 19th century would have recognized the weapons and tactics of the early 17th century. Waterloo was the end of an era. After the slaughter of the Napoleonic Wars, Europe enjoyed four decades of peace. But while Europe's armies rested, her factories forged ahead. When war broke out again, generals could draw on new technology. The train. The telegraph. The steamship. The Crimean War started when Russia attacked the ailing empire of Ottoman Turkey. Fearing Russian expansion, Britain and France sided with Turkey. In September 1854, the Allied army set sail for the Crimea, a peninsula of the Ukraine. Troops traveled by steamship. This new means of transport was so reliable that huge military operations could now be launched from afar to a precise plan and timetable. Steam power landed a vast stockpile of stores and ammunition exactly where and when they were needed. French and British armies poured ashore. Their first objective was the Russian naval base of Sebastopol. As the Allies set out, a Russian army blocked their way along the rocky heights overlooking the Alma River. For all their industrial strength, at the Battle of Alma, the Russians were armed with muskets much like the ones used by their grandfathers against Napoleon. Their effective range was no more than 200 yards, less than the longbows used by English archers five centuries before. The British and French had a new weapon, the rifle and minier bullet. The minier bullet was hollow at the base. It expanded into the grooved gun barrel, harnessing the full power of the explosion and leaving the muzzle of the rifle with a powerful spin. It had a killing range of 500 yards, 
nearly three times the lethal distance of the Russian muskets. Leo Tolstoy, Russian author of War and Peace, fought as a young artillery officer at the Battle of the Alma. He described the impact of the Allied rifle fire. You have only managed to climb a little way when bullets begin to hum around you. All around you seem to hear the various sounds that bullets make, from the ones that hum like bees to the ones that whistle rapidly by or twang with a noise like a plucked string. It shakes you to the core and inspires you with a profound sense of dread. With many a bullets, the British slaughtered the massed columns of Russians before Tolstoy and his men could even see them. The Battle of the Alma was a turning point in the history of war. The Minier bullet, a small step in the science of ballistics, made artillerymen like the young Tolstoy horribly vulnerable to infantry fire. On the open field of battle, artillery's dominance was over. Field guns of the future would have to dig in out of sight. The British and French advanced in triumph. Near the port of Balaclava, the Russians turned to fight again. At Balaclava, the British commander ordered a cavalry unit to capture a battery of Russian guns. The unit was the Light Brigade. The orders they received were unclear. The Light Brigade charged straight down a narrow artillery line valley toward the guns at the far end. For a whole mile, the British cavalrymen ran a gauntlet of cannon fire. The Light Brigade took the Russian guns, but couldn't hold them. They were forced to retreat back down the Valley of Death. Of 673 cavalrymen, 247 were killed. Minier bullets and steamships gave the Allies the upper hand, but at Balaclava, tactics had not caught up with technology. The day of the cavalry charge was already over before Balaclava. The Light Brigade had to perish to prove it. All over the Crimea, peacetime inventions were finding wartime uses. French officers storming the Russian fortress of Malakoff were the first to use watches accurate enough to be synchronized before the attack. Standard practice on the battlefield ever since. New communications technology was changing war in unexpected ways. William Howard Russell, the world's first war correspondent, reported on the Crimean War for the influential London Times. Russell arrived in the Crimea full of enthusiasm for the war. But as winter set in and he witnessed the neglect of wounded soldiers, Russell's enthusiasm turned to anger. The dead laid out as they died were lying side by side with the living. The stench was appalling. For all I could observe, these men died without the least effort to save them. From the commanding general down, the regimental colonels, they simply didn't care. They weren't interested. It was an army that basically was willing to sacrifice its soldiers um, because they fundamentally didn't seem to care. British public opinion was outraged. Despite efforts by the military to gag him, Russell's reports brought down the British government. They also inspired a British woman to go to the Crimea. Her influence on military medical care was simple and revolutionary. Florence Nightingale. 
Her great contribution in the Crimea was to clean up the hospital that she was working in, the Scutari, markedly reduce the death rate by nursing care, by better diet, by simple cleanliness. When Miss Nightingale came home, she said, I stand at the altar of those murdered men, and while I live, I shall defend their cause. And she did. When the war was over, Florence Nightingale's work led to the foundation of the Army Medical School, a fitting tribute. The Crimean War was the first to be influenced by the press. The soldiers portrayed in Roger Fenton's pioneering photos were seen only by a privileged few, but the words of the journalists got through. From now on, the photographer and the reporter would be fixtures on the battlefield. Looking over their shoulder would be public opinion. July 18th, 